Um, folks, we're just going to give it another another one minute. Usually we start about three minutes after. Um, so one more minute and we'll get started. Um, we'll jump right in. Um, so bear with us for a moment. So I'm going to start just with some basics on how to how to use this. Um, hold on one second. Okay. Um, so the basics are first of all, you're all seeing this in um, in speaker view. Um, there might I believe it's locked for that for most of you. Um, if you want to see the closed captions, as you've got in a note on the side, closed captions are available um, on the bottom of the screen. You could click on the closed caption option um, and follow us there. Um, questions for the Q&A, um, you could add at any time really, though best to wait till the end of the Q&A. You could add them at the, with the Q&A button. The chat button is really for just conversations back and forth um, and, uh, saying hello, but uh, the Q&A is where you will ask your questions, so click on Q&A. Um, we are going to have you ask your questions in a live format today, if possible. So um, ask, ask your question by typing into the Q&A, and our producers here will contact you, and, um, and we, will, we will open your microphone so you can join the conversation. We have few, full control over your microphone in this format. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, we hope you loved The Witch Hunters. It's one of my favorite films of the festival. Um, I'll admit, uh, I mean, first of all, it's just a genre that speaks to me. And, um, and from the disability perspective, it's also, I feel it's one of those films that is not about the disability, really. It's, uh, it's really um, about many other things and the disability happens to just be a part of it. And we love that and it was done authentically, which we love. So um, it's really, really a fantastic film. Um, we are excited to have everybody here today. We have a full day of events. We hope you, you join us um, for all the wonderful events that are coming up. Um, I wanna give a big thank you to our partners. Um, first of all, the accessibility of this film um, was provided by Adapt Community Network. Um, and they've been partners for years and wonderful supporters, and they provided both the audio description and the captioning. So thank you very, very much for that and, um, and for everything they do. Please check out all of our partners and their work. Um, I just lost my place, but I'll thank some of our other partners in a moment. Um, the Children's Museum of Art, Extreme Kids and Crew, and Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Um, please check them all out online, but also check out all of our partners if you go to the partner page at realabilities.org slash New York. You can find our partner page there and look at all the wonderful partners that allow this festival to exist and are part of the reason that this festival exists. Um, other, other housekeeping to mention, I think that's basically it, except that up next at 2.30 is the film Don't Foil My Plans, a fantastic documentary. Then we have the beauty and self-advocacy um, um, panel at 4.30, um, expressions through art panel at 6 p.m. And then finally at 7.30 p.m., Amy's Victory Dance. So we have basically filled your day. You have no reason to go outside. Um, you're not supposed to go outside. Um, Stay with us all day. We're here also till tomorrow. And our moderator for this conversation, our good friend and advocate, activist, um, and just um, film buff, um, Lawrence Carter Long, will actually also be moderating, if you're not sick of him, um, tomorrow night's closing night conversation with Judith, Judith Human. Um, and um, then uh, we'll be following that with the film Bedlam. So please join us for those events. Um, I'm going to actually hand things over to Lawrence's capable hands and just mention that we're, he's gonna be in conversation with uh, Roshko Milkovich, I got it right, uh, who um, is the director of the film. Over to you, Lawrence.
Thank you, Yitzi. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. Um, hi, Rashko. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, to have this conversation. So by now, I hope that everybody's seen the film. And, um, and we can use that as our launching off point for this conversation. I tried to set the tone with the poster behind me. Um, so, Rashko, since so one of the points um, um, of this film uh, is, is uh, I, about a superhero, um, but I, I think it's um, in many ways a film about the tension that can exist between imagination and reality. Right, and imagination can be, the extremes of imagination can be very dark, right, or very bright. You can be the hero, or you can, you can imagine the best and imagine the worst. Um, and I think this film kind of does that. And I wanted to ask, what, what's, since it is about a superhero in a lot of ways, what's the origin story of the, what, what, where, were the, where did the ideas come from and what made you decide, what was the burning thing that said, I've got to make this film? All right. Um, wow, that's an interesting question. Um, so, actually, I I didn't write the script. The, the script was it kind of landed into my lap. Um, I loved it, but in the first version of the script, Jovan did not be uh, become a superhero. He had the fantasy world, but in each fantasy, he would be something completely different. Like. For ex example, in one fantasy, he would be a vampire hunter. In the next fantasy, he would be a space marine. Uh, in the next fantasy, he would be a pirate captain. So they were kind of all over the place. I, I could relate to that daydream moment. Um, I, I used to be, and still am, quite a daydreamer and love to kind of uh, frolic about in, in the world of fantasy. So, but I thought, you know, um, I think... Uh, this really appeals to my scriptwriter and his generation, and he was 35 at uh, the time. Uh, it kind of more reminded me of the Saturday, uh, Sunday morning cartoons that we'd, you know, watch when we were kids. And uh, I was lucky enough to, I am lucky enough to have a young brother, a much younger brother, who was at the time an eight-year-old, who was in love as I am with comic books and the MCU. So uh, I actually developed the idea of the shade with him. Uh, he's a huge fan of Batman because he inherited all my comics. Uh, so we sat down for a couple of weekends together and just thought, okay, let's, uh, let's spitball. Let's see w what magic or su superhero power would you like to to uh, possess and why. And that's kind of how the two of us together uh, started spitballing the idea of, of the shade. And for me, it was very important that every fantasy that Johan goes into is in some way connected to his emotional state at the point where he's going into the fantasy. So, you know, when, when the witch defeats him as the shade, he's, you know, he's in a very raw, shaken emotional state. But at, at the beginning of the film, when he fights the bullies and wins, you know, you can see, okay, this guy, uh, you, you know, has, has something good going for him. So that's kind of roughly the, the idea behind, behind the whole superhero scenario. When I was a, a ten-year-old kid, um, there was a lot that I could I could relate. When I was a ten-year-old kid, right, I had a very active imagination, um, very much like uh, you know, and um, I, I think I've carried that with me uh, as an adult. Now, um, the 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 situations that set up those fantasy sequences, I think, um, can speak to universally to to almost any ten-year-old, but but particularly kids who might have disabilities. You know, I wasn't running around the neighborhood quite as much as my, uh, I have cerebral palsy as well, as my non-disabled peers, um, um, but my imagination, all that stuff was going on inside my head. One of, one of the themes that sort of comes up that, that brings the two protagonists together, right, uh, Jovan and Malika, uh, is bullying, right? And it's that's something that we've heard a lot in the media and in the press um, about why did you, why did you, position that as a plot point at the beginning of the film as a setup? Well, um, because that's something that, I, as you said, is, is universe, sadly 
universal in any generation. I was, I was bullied as a kid um, in, in grade school and middle school. Um, I was, uh, um, uh, as, as was my, my kid, as was my kid brother as well. So I thought, you know, um, both Jovan and Milica in the beginning feel ostracized by, by their peers. Uh, Jovan, because of, she's, of, she's an outsider as well. She comes in from another town. Right? Exactly. She's, she's like the, the new kid on the block and, you know, she's from a different, uh, um, different social standing than the rest of the kids, you know, and uh, her, her mom and dad are going through a tough divorce. She's living with her grandmother in a small house. She doesn't have like uh, a new iPhone or, or uh, you know, new gadgets that all the kids do have in school. So you're immediately, you stand out and, you know, they, they start making fun of her. Uh, but what was beautiful to me and it, it, it was like that for me when I was a kid, I also kind of found a, super cool friend uh, who was also being made fun of. And um, in that, I guess, uh, the two of us being outcasts, we found each other and made a pact or a clan or whatever you want to call it. There's, a, there's a solidarity there, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, that, that kind of uh, just spoke to me as, as, you know, okay, this is probably the best, best, uh, um, uh, point to get these two characters together, but also introduce the audience to a very important topic that I think parents should talk about more with their kids, and that's bullying, because it still goes on, no, e even though we've been battling it as a society for ages now. Uh, but I think uh, bullying comes from, um, you know, from, from, from the household, uh, and it's something that you should address as a parent. So that, that's kind of the whole idea bef behind The Witch Hunters is we wanted to make a very entertaining film for kids, but we also wanted to make a film that's uh, gonna, uh, I guess, get some, some topics going between you know, the kids and their peers, the kids and the teachers, and of course the kids and the parents. Uh, so it's kind of, let's, let's try and make an educational film but let's try and not spoon feed it to the kids. Let's make it fun. And then hopefully someone picks something up from it. Well, and, and that, that's a lead into to another question that I had about the film as I'm watching it. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, because they're, it's, it's called show business, right? It's an, in, it's an industry and you have to market these kind of things. And, and I wondered in your estimation, is this, because in some places where it's been screened previously, it's been uh, in the block of children's films, right? Other places, it hasn't been. And I, I was just wondering, in your estimation, would you say that this is a children's film or is it a film about children? Um, I'm going to cheat here, and I'm going to say it's a family film. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I know that's that's a really long. And, well, and explain that dis explain that distinction, if you would. Okay, so um, a family film, uh, in my opinion, is a film that can be enjoyed uh, by both the kids and the parents. So the target range is from seven to to like seventy seven, right? Whereas a, a strictly kids film, I'm not gonna. Uh, uh, call anyone out but a kid's film is I take my brother to see this film in the cinema he has fun but I can't wait for it to end you know <laughs> so I'm not fond of the term kid's film um I I, I prefer a uh, family film or as you said a, a film about children but those those can be uh not for children at all. I've seen some films about children that have children as the main protagonists, but you know the topics that they deal with are are rated. Uh, just well, and the and the subplot here. Let's let's not be shy about it. The subplot here. I mean, it's about a friendship, obstinately, and it's about imagination. But but the dark side of the imagination. You know, there's a there's a murder plot here, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but but that's that's part of the fabric of this film, right? I think that's the you know 
whereas um, um, Jovan is sort of looking to be the superhero, the dark side of that is you just uh, eliminate those who are, you know, causing you pain or stress or whatever. Causing trouble. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, that that entire idea of um, of, of you know them quote unquote planning a murder um, also came about from from uh, my, my brother arson I know it sounds like arson but no it's <laughs> it's just a French French name um, so he he uh, he's 16 years younger than I am and we have a sister who is seven years younger than I am so she's older to him and his favorite game growing up was uh, uh, let's, let's Kill Masha, our sister. And I was like, dude, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. No, 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 let's play Kill Masha. And, you know, that's kind of his, just a childish, you have no idea what you're actually saying and what it actually implies. Uh, but in terms of, like, the imagination or whatever, it's, it's victory over someone. So... We just kind of ran with it, and because it was, uh, it was something that my kid brother used to say. I never actually thought about that being something that might be perceived as dangerous. And the interesting thing is, uh, it was screened all over Europe, all over Asia, uh, and no one ever had any uh, points to to that uh, uh, part of the story until we screened. Uh, through uh, you know the U.S. and and in Canada as well, uh, and then people were like, "What? Do you have a children's film that has a murder pro plot in it? What's happening here?" So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, once you see the film, I guess you realize that it's not really a murder plot. But okay, fine, kids. Uh, well, and, and it and it seems to be one of the the things I really appreciate among many about this film is it is it. It's easy, I think, sometimes when one grows up to leave that that ten year old behind, right? And to and to and to look at a child, a, a film about children uh, through an adult's point of view, and you miss the extremes that a ten year old lives, right? I think to, before you've had too much experience uh, with real life. It's all very vivid. It's all extreme. It's you know, as you take it as far as you can go because it doesn't have that real, that realness to it. Right. Um, um, you know, you can fantasize about murder or you can fantasize about being a hero, and it's all big and it's all bold because your imagination is unlimited. You can go anywhere, and I I I, I love the way that you and I love the way that the film maintain that sense of of kind of being 10 you know and 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 where it's it's all unfettered it's all big it's all bold without any apologies um i i i also wanted to, to you know the backdrop of this film um when you get back into real life for these characters is a divorce right mm -hmm. it's it's you know, there's what sort of sparks that murder idea, which I think goes right back to being a 10 year old, is, the, is um, Malika's parents are getting a divorce. So she imagines um, um, that her father's new girlfriend, because she sees him drinking potions and all these things, yoga instructor, right? But, but, but he's, you know, she imagines the worst here. And, and but it doesn't patronize and it doesn't pander um, to anybody. I, I love how comfortably the film lives within those extremes, um, um, and I and and how toward the end, right? You can see how um, uh, Jovan is sort of facing his struggles as he reaches an age where he's going to be more independent, and it doesn't shy away from those kind of struggles, like walking up the stairs, right? And how all that's tough on the surface, it seems to be a turning point for him. As he faces that challenge, um, he then ventures out, they ride a bus. Talk a little bit about um, why you included that, what the importance of that moment in the film. So, and what comes after it? Right, uh, well, what, what comes after it in, in our film is, 
I, I kind of think uh, that he kind of married the two worlds, the world of imagination and the world he lives in right now, which I, I think, as you said, I think it's very important to kind of try and keep that world of imagination inside, alive and well inside of you up until your old age, <laughs> because it, it can have some real great benefit. Um, but for me is, you know, he, he, he just uh, kind of felt like um, that he was a hero, um, you know, inside. And by the end of the film, by helping his friend, I think he, he kind of gets acknowledged uh, uh, to actually be a hero. So that's some, kind of the, the overarching theme of, of Jovan. But in terms of um, uh, just CP, generally a huge problem here at home is that we still have public transport that is not accessible uh, by everyone. And it's ac actually a real, real thing. Um, so uh, 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 that, that scene just kind of, also a lot of kids with uh, uh, different disabilities are considered almost invisible. It's kind of a taboo here back home. Uh, so we wanted to make a, uh, a film that's a media that's enjoyed by everyone and try and get these uh, um, subjects out there, you know, talked about it, uh, because something as easy as riding a bus from point A to point B should, you know, be available to everyone. But here it, it obviously is not. And no one really thinks about that. You know, if you don't have someone with a, a disability in your immediate uh, circle of, of people in your life, you never stop and think like, wow, can, can everyone use the bus? You, you just take it for granted, right? So it was just something that most of us take for granted as and it, it's as easy as taking the bus. For Jovan, who is kind of still struggling with, with himself uh, and also with, with the concept of asking for help, which is also a very Balkan thing. If you're a man, uh, you shouldn't be, <laughs> you know, you have to do everything by yourself. And what my kid brother told me is, well, even Iron Man can ask the Hulk for help. You know, why, <laughs> why shouldn't you be able to? It's like a normal thing. I'm sorry if I kind of veered off the subject here. My cat has been trying to get on top of my head, so I'm, I'm trying to. No, that's okay. Who's introduce your cat to us, please? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Batman. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> and and like a cat will do, you know, Batman's going. Make himself known, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that, and I, I think that sense of, 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 of sort of that transition, right? Any of those transitions, sort of within life, from, from you know, because because Jovan it lives kind of a sheltered life. Parents are a little protective. They kind of keep him in this cocoon, right? He he goes to school before anybody else arrives. Exactly. So they're not seeing him walk, right? He's not being bullied in those moments. Then yet it leaves, it ends, right, with that moment where after the, 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 the murder plot has been foiled, right, and after they've moved through that whole process, um, you know, he gets on the bus by himself, right? He well, he, uh, with a bit of help. With a bit of help, right, with a bit of help. But, but and, and that's what I, I think, particularly in these times, right, as we're all kind of stuck at home, and we're, you know, imagining what is the world going to be once this COVID-19 thing is over. Um, I think we're, we're finding out, all of us, ways we never could have anticipated how we need to rely on a little help from our friends, right? And, and I think that has a particular relevance um, right now that maybe it wouldn't have had even had prior to all of this. Um, um, that you use that, you, you ask for help, you get, you move to the next stage, you move to the next, to the next level. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, that's, you know, that's what gets you there. Um, so we have some questions um, from folks who are, who are watching and, and listening at home. So uh, ready, steady, go. Let's, uh, let's see um, what, the, what the first one is. Okay, I think I'm not muted anymore. Um, 
Hi, um, I was wondering, I guess, first. Um, and if you could, yeah. please, and if you could, before you ask your question, just tell us your first name and where you're, uh, where you're, where you're uh, viewing from. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Morgan. Um, I actually work with the festival, but I don't get to ask filmmakers questions when we're helping pick the films. So um, first I was wondering, I guess, um, what was your casting process like and where did you find um, the two main actors? And I think everyone would love to know, you know, what you're working on next. Uh, cool. Uh, well, um, the casting process itself was very long. It took us nine months. Um, and, and I think it's important to point out, uh, Roscoe, that this film is authentically cast. The, the actor who played Jovan actually has cerebral palsy. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, the thing is, um, before I, I started working on this film, I had very little experience uh, with CP at all. So um, I, I uh, went to, uh, first I spoke to my scriptwriter, whose sister has CP, and I met with her, but she's, she, she was 27 at the time. Uh, so I just talked a lot with her and she told me, you know, I think it would be a great idea to go to Sokolbanska, which is a uh, like medical center in Belgrade where uh, kids with CP uh, come after school uh, to do their uh, 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 rehabilitation exercises. And, and so I so met very similar to what very similar to what you see in the film. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So um, I went there, uh, spoke to, to the doctors, very uh, uh, friendly, and just pointed me in the right direction. And they said, you know, if you want, we can ask the parents if they'd be okay with it and just come over to one of these sessions and just meet the kids. Uh, so uh, I got a, a green light from the parents and I ended up going there for three weeks and just hanging around these with these kids. And I was amazed uh, by, by how these kids were uh, uh, just taken in by the, the story of the film and how intelligent they were and how funny they were. One of them just had like a, a sense of humor of a 30 year old and he's like an eight year old kid. Uh, so I was just taken away by, by them. And I spoke to my producer and I said, look, I know, you, I know you said you want to cast a kid actor and then make him play someone who has CP, but I think, I'm sure that we can find a very talented kid. And I think it's also going to have a much greater impact, not just for the film, but for the kid. You know, we can, we can actually help someone with this. And I think it, it would be amazing. Um, she said no immediately uh, because it would cost a lot more money. Uh, after three days, she phones me back and she says, look, I'll give you two months to find a kid. And if you can't, then we'll, we'll do it my way. I said, okay. And uh, we called a lot of NGOs that work with kids with CP. They, they put us in touch with a lot of homes, a lot of parents. We shared the script with them and just said, we'd love to, if you have, if your kid would like to participate, we'd love to meet him. And I phoned my producer and I said, okay, now we're going together. We got into my car and met, went to meet five little boys. And once we, we did the tour that weekend, she said, okay, I'll, I'll give you all the time you need uh, because these five kids were just amazing. So it turned into a, a, a six month long adventure of just traveling through the entire country and, and meeting eight to 12 year olds with CP and just playing with them with the script and, and trying different things. And by the end of it, we had uh, about 30, 35 contenders, uh, each with their own set of qualities. In the meantime, we had an open call for Milica and more than 600 little girls ages eight to 12 uh, came to that casting. So it was just mayhem for, for days and days of, of just, uh, uh, you know, going, going through these auditions. And at, at the end of, of those six months, we had uh, the, uh, narrowed it down to 10 boys and, and uh, 10 girls. And we kind of started um, just uh, doing auditions with mixing pairs of them together. 
And what is crazy is usually uh, 10 year old boys and girls aren't really fond of each other. There's that, you know, like animosity, mm -hmm. icky, icky girls and, and uh, icky boys. Um, and we had the casting session with Mich Mikhailo, who plays Jovan, and Silma, who plays Milica. And it just felt like they knew each other for a hundred years. Like they've been friends for such a long time. And by the end of it, we take a photo of the two of them. Every single one in every group would be like 10 feet away from each other in the photo. And the two of them were like buddies like this. And just, <laughs> they, they laughed uncontrollably. We couldn't have one picture where they aren't blurry because they were, they were just laughing all the time. Uh, so, and you the know, chemistry, the chemistry comes across on the screen. Ex exactly. Exactly. I knew right then and there, okay, it's them because this, this is something you can't produce, uh, from, you know, acting methods. This is just, you have it or you don't. And they definitely did. So it was a, so as a, as a follow-up question, I'm curious, cause there's a, we hear this a lot you know, within because I, I work with uh, the the disability rights education and uh, defense fund and we have a disability media project one of the things we hear a lot is a fear that it's going to cost more money how do we do it you know a lot of obstacles people kind of have in their minds um, which prevent these things from happening did it cost more money and was it worth it if it did it it did not cost a cent more than it would have cost uh, other, the other way around. It, the, the worth is unmeasurable. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing what Miha, Mihailo brought to, to this film and what in turn he got from this film uh, and how it, it had an impact in his life because, you know, he was, he was a bullied kid in school um, and we spent a lot of time together and I, I remember the first time there was a billboard of the film, you know, starting to pop up through Belgrade. He called me ecstatic because everyone in school suddenly now viewed him as this, this cool actor kid. He has, he has a film coming out. He must be so important. So his entire uh, life just had a 180 uh, degree turn at school. Uh, it, it really did not cost a penny more uh, because in any case, working with, with kids, you have to have a tutor uh, there. And um, here in Serbia, you have a physical therapist that is provided by the healthcare. And he's going to come over wherever you are, uh, at home or in your trailer on set or whatever. And you're going to do uh, your physical therapy. I mean, it's a must. So it really did not cost a cent right. more. And, and can you give us one example, before I go to the next question, can you give us one example of how we're working with him specifically made it, added something to the film itself, something you couldn't have seen in the development process, maybe on set or as you were shooting? Well, uh, the thing is, uh, it was a really emotional process. Uh, the rehearsals, where we picked them, and said, okay, you're definitely playing Mihailo, Mihailo, you're definitely playing Jovan, and Milica, you're, you're playing Silma. For me, the toughest uh, moral, I think, thing uh, in the whole film was the scene where he tries to go up the stairs and he can't by himself, and he falls down and he cries and he says, I want a new body. And I, I thought, you know, he is in this situation. Am I allowed to? to do you even talk to him about this? And I first, of course, talked to his parents and they told me they had a, this, uh, this exact same scene happen to them uh, a couple of years prior. And, and of course, the, the biggest thing is uh, his parents who were wonderful people, really had a great way of, you know, uh, uh, helping him come to terms with, with everything that's been happening to him. So. I mean, that's, that's a huge, huge bonus. And I think he's very lucky to have them as well. So uh, I, I remember talking to him about it. And emotionally, uh, he's, he, he was 11 at the time. He was more uh, mature than I think myself even at the time. So he really helped me come to, to terms with all of the, the, the scenes that, that he did. And he said, 
look, I um, I want to do I want to do this because I think it it might help someone else. And you know, once once this eleven year old who's this high at the time, and I'm like a towering giant, and he he tells me it's dude, it's fine. If this helps, we're gonna do it. <laughs> so uh, that really destroyed me. I mean, I I was so happy um, at the time, but. Um, I think he he brings something. Um, he's also a very talented actor, you know, above anything else. Uh, and I I don't think anyone else could have done a a job as well as he has, uh, regardless of of you know if they had a, a CP or not. But I think. Well, you well, the the thing with acting right is you bring what you've got. And he exactly. had more tools in the toolkit than an actor who wouldn't have had cerebral palsy. Right? Exactly. He had something he could bring um, um, to that process. You know, there's a there's a maxim that we kind of talk about in disability circles: the dignity of risk. Right? That, that right. people with disabilities should be have to fail, have opportunities to fail or succeed, along with non-disabled peers. And I think that illustrates it beautifully. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to. I want to go on to a next question uh, from Kumal. Kumal, you are up. Uh, would you please introduce yourself uh, uh, when you come when you come on? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, um, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Kanal Mahajan, and I'm from uh, New, uh, New, New from New, New from New York City. Um, yeah, um, yeah. My, my my question is 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 actually j just on something you just mentioned. Is um, like I love how you went to places that most disability um, kind of films don't tend to go like what whenever you you show that scene of um when the kid um fell and he said like i want a new body and like i mean um i I'm, i've had a lifelong stuttering uh disability and so that part just really made me tear up just this um just you 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 know because i know that's such a true feeling for some people with disabilities, just on on their um, on on their own journeys, um, and then I, I I also love just how how you showed that that doctor like having that acceptance conversation with, with the kids. So I mean, like, what what kind of inspired you to go that deep um, and and and, um, and and really address this? Um, kind of point that that we that we we that we 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 all know is is so um, is just so relevant in, in the disability community. But, but 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 like from what I've seen, a lot of films don't tend to kind of go so deep into that acceptance journey and and show that part there. Right. Well, uh, I think that uh, first off, thank you for the kind words. Uh, but I, I think that most of uh, what authors tend to do is is they kind of set up the film. Uh, if you have someone with a disability in your film, they're usually a victim, and this is something that we definitely wanted to avoid. And we wanted to make a film where he's, you know, he's a hero. But on the hero's journey, uh, you have to have some sort of an amplitude of of ups and downs. And uh, they've then they've got to have things to they've got to have things to fight against, right? They've got to have obstacles in order for for it to be a dream. exactly, exactly. So so um, we I talked a lot to uh, uh, with with my scriptwriter to a lot of people uh, with CP and just gave them out the script and said, guys, you know, please give us as much feedback as you can and what everyone said was this scene is spot on this is something that you have to have because it's true it happened to me here it happened to me here it happened to me here and then talking to Mihaila's parents I remember you know I uh, it was just a very emotional talk uh the three of us hugging <laughs> after they just read the script and they said I, we kind of feel like you spied on us and our lives, <laughs> uh, how did you know uh, this, this scene looks like this, you know? So I said, okay, we, uh, I think, of course, it's, it has a lot of fantasy elements, 
but when we talk about emotion, let's try and make it as lifelike and as true as possible. So that's kind of what inspired us to definitely have that aspect in the film, especially since not, not a lot of people uh, use it at all. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and Rashko, I'm going to turn this over to Isaac uh, in a moment, but I just want, wanted to say it's it's an amazing piece of work. It's one of my absolute favorites um, um, for this festival and from all time. I just adore everything about it. Best of luck um, with the film. Is there a place, you know, you're in the middle of the process, right? Getting distribution deals and all those sorts of things. Is there a one-stop shop or a place people can go to um, follow, um, the, you know, where the film is going and what's happening next? Uh, we, we do have both a Facebook page and an Instagram page. Uh, so those would be the go-to places just to keep, uh, keep up, up with uh, what's happening. Sadly, we don't have uh, U.S. distribution yet. But hopefully, once that happens, uh, it's going to be on there. And again, thank you guys for, for having me here. And thank you for your kind words. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Isaac? Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. And thank you. Thank you, Roscoe. This um, has been a wonderful conversation that I hope people will use as this film gets out there and more people see it and can reference back and learn a lot more. Um, up next here is our film, Don't Foil My Plans. Um, followed by a conversation um, with, uh, that's going to be led by Eileen Lehner, um, who is for next, from Next for Autism. So please join us for that and for the conversation. Um, that film is um, starting at 2.30, or I'm sure you have the links now. You could technically start it immediately. Um, and then join us for the conversation at 3.30. Um, we have then two more panels coming, Beauty, Self-Advocacy, uh, disabil and Disability, a cultural examination, and then a, co a conversation expressions through art panel. And then finally ending the day with Amy's Victory Dance. Tomorrow night, as I mentioned, is closing night with uh, Judith Human, and then the film Bedlam. So please join us for all of those and help us spread the word. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you all. Um, please everyone stay safe. Our hearts and thoughts go out to everyone who's affected by this horrible virus. And um, we hope you'll join us for more programs and we'll be able to provide programs throughout this entire period. Thank you very much, guys, and we'll see you soon.